Okay, I want to talk about Psi from the point of view of a range of connections being consistent with the theme of this program. And I want to start basically, oh, first I'm going to figure out how to do this here. Uh, a little bit of a background. I was involved with remote viewing research from about 1976 to 1993 in various capacities, uh, connecting with SRI in the research environment, and then ultimately with the Fort Meade Remote Viewing Unit at Fort Meade, Maryland. But during this time, I did other things also. I was a, involved in remote viewing by day and side dreaming by night. And you can't get any better than that. <laughs> and my interest in side dreaming actually goes back to about 1970 when I became familiar with uh, Stan Kretmer and Monty Allman's work at the Maimonides uh, Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. So I continued that interest on into my personal life and did experiments along the way with a lot of people looking at Psy Dreaming as well as by day, um, night by Psy Dreaming and, and day with remote viewing. And my main objective with the Psy Dream work was to see what kind of accuracy can an individual achieve by seeking Psy Dream? And also what is most important to me, my interest at the time and still is, what is the process going on here? How are the images, dream images created? How is information transferred or accessed from the object, the target, into the dreaming mind? And also, how can I improve proficiency over time? Now, one of the most exciting target pools I ever ran into was the one used at the Maimonides Medical Center. Now, this target pool is 1,024 slides. And half of them are black and white, and the other half are color. And there are ten, nine other different categories in there. You just can't second guess what's coming up next. I bought a copy, it cost me about six to seven hundred dollars in 1978, just to pursue independent work to track along the Maimonides work, even though they never really published a lot on their work with the slides. I found them to be extremely valuable to work with from a learning point of view. They were not good from a statistical analysis point of view. Uh, the 1024 derives from 2 to the 10 power, but the analysis didn't work too well because at that time it wasn't realized just how much overlap there is between these 10 categories of myth, human, food, artifacts, whatever natural or whatever other category is in there, it's really difficult for a side dreamer or even a remote viewer, if you're doing this, to identify the different categories. But they're great learning tools as well. And the one category that I had the most fun with is the one that's called body parts. But that's another story. Now, one of the things that was very exciting about a year ago, Russ Targ brought a television crew to my home in Pennsylvania. And uh, the idea of recording what some of his old timers remembered from the good old SRI research days and also the Stargate program. While I was there, Russ expressed a strong interest in side dreaming, so I dug out some old records. And to my surprise, I found a package in there that is totally documented. It's beyond my control. Um, a couple of people and I worked on this, sketched it, sent it to another person, somebody else recorded it. Perfect, wonderful controls on it. It was double blind, so we didn't know, nobody knew what the target picture was, the target slide. There were two of us really working on this, myself and a woman friend, and everything was selected by others. We produced sketches, narratives, and whatever. I'm going to go into three of these because even though this is uh, 35 years old, I look back at these three slides and I can see this is all I really ever needed to know about side dreaming from what I learned in those three slides. And so I'll go through a few little specifics on this. My companion in this adventure <clears throat> only had one dream that night. I come to the river, jump in and start swimming. 
She didn't want to record it and give it to me. I said, no, write it up and give it to the controller. Let them worry about it. In my dream, I had two very distinct dreams. And when that happens to me, I superimpose the results. The first set of dreams showed what I thought was a huge red mountain and a river behind it and a swamp. And the second dream, next to the, a little bit to the left of it, was this huge red dome that I thought was some kind of mesa. And a, a red trail, a white trail around it, and a white reflecting tree. And the most unusual part was those squares. The tiny, tiny squares went right through the mountain. Here's the target picture. So now you see what's happening here. Totally misanalyzed it. This is not a mountain. It's a foot with a stocking sticking in. There's an apple there and a key drilling into the, into the apple. It's not a mesa. But the squares there are, are very uniform. Um, there's a tiny square that the dreaming mind amplified into a lot of tiny squares. My companion chose to go swimming. And I, in my dreaming mind, because I had just come back from Colorado hiking around in the, those colored mountains up there, I chose to go hiking in, the, well, the foothills. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't resist that one. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> buoyed up by that experience, even though we didn't name it correctly, although my companion had the right idea. Um, oh, by the way, everything's fictitious in there. Uh, that's not a real river. That's, that's some kind of turf and a uh, rug. So she didn't really dive into water. It was the turf that she dove into. I didn't tell her that. Okay, now the next night, <clears throat> when we got into the next project, I was so excited about the results from the previous night that all of a sudden I'm looking at the ceiling and now I see a skull looking down at me. Wow, what happened? Because I, I know from experience this is not up there, it's in my mind, it's a projection from my mind. Well, I overcame that little surge of fear and said, okay, let's go back and see what I can dream about this concealed slide target somewhere. It was about five miles away from me, not, in, not near, near where we were. So really strange things happened. <clears throat> I'll start with the bottom row of figures. The first dream showing that unusual face. Again, a dream about a somewhat grotesque looking face. Okay, that ends. But now something really unusual happens. I am attacked by an alien. In the dream, the shrouded figure shows up. Hardly any face, could hardly see it. It's got these funny stripes and comes into the dreams, into my dreaming mind, my dream time, my dream theater of the mind, and attacks me. So I struggle with it. Finally get rid of it. Wow, what was that about? My companion ended up looking at a field that's burning with fire in it, a cartoon figure. Uh, and a few other details that she didn't draw. I had no idea what this was about. It really, it's not a bad picture. What happened? Why should both of us end up with fear and terror from this simple looking picture? Now there's an odd looking face there that could generate a reaction called fear. So we thought, we, and those flowers in the field do resemble leaping flames. And, but we both la lashed on to this terror and the theme aspect. Now why was that? Well, 35 years later, I'm looking at this. Then I saw something I didn't see 35 years ago. I cut out the zebra and I compared it to the shrouded figure. Now I saw what happened. My subconscious mind came into that slide too fast. I hit the fight-flight syndrome in me. That's deep down in my brain, in the reptilian part of my brain. The very first place where the threat pictures show up is there. And my subconscious mind didn't make the distinction. It's old stuff. Look out, jump, run. 
So I erroneously, at a subconscious level, made a poor judgment. And I thought it was an alien. It's just a simple zebra. But the zebra itself is a very smart animal. That's a wonderful camouflage. It's an optical illusion. When the lions and the tigers run at a herd of running zebras, they're confused. They leap into air and jump on nothing. So I was confused also at a subconscious level and then misinterpreted it as an alien attack. Okay, we got together for the third one and said, all right, let us both focus on you. We'll change thoughts of intention. I hope you, my partner, she hopes me, me, will do really well on the next one. We want to try to get an integrated picture of what this third slide is. And here are the results. And we all had the whole group work with us. We had the whole group, eight of us, focus on my partner, Barbara, and myself. Do well. We are hoping for you to do well on this last slide. Here's our sketch. My partner shows, drew the next, the one above that. I drew the one below that. We had in the dream community what we would call a mutual dream. They were almost identical. Her, her dream, she's in a very specific landscape that she thought was covered with a bluish tinted snow. There's a structure in the background that's full of triangles and rectangles. And she had these strange animals come into the picture. On the bottom one, I think it's a landscape tinged with moonlight. It's full of rocks, there's a gully, <clears throat> there's strange little creatures down there that I think are fossils. And then these lizards come into the scene. Yeah, a little scary place. That's the interesting thing about these slides. Here's the picture. Okay, we had the ambience correct, but we really, I don't know where those animals came from. Okay, so I put that aside. 35 years later, I'm looking at it. I said, now wait a minute. Let's take a look at this. The face that she drew looks very much like the eyes sticking out of that rock structure. The animals I drew look very much like those lizards that are the rock shapes in the background that could resemble lizards. In other words, what happened again was like the one before. A quick hit on that picture, we react from the point of view of something very primitive inside of us. It's something to run from. It's a prehistoric animal coming at us. Now we're really getting down into the very depths of our collective unconscious, presented in a dream. Because we don't have control over the dream. So in normal vision, light comes in, eye, the eye sees it, goes into the retina, the optic system, it goes to the amygdala, uh, the thalamus, the amygdala, and down into or up into the cortex. We make a decision and decide what to do. But what happens when there's a threat? That's bypassed. This goes boom, boom, boom. We don't have any idea, consciously, or even at the first level of subconscious analysis, of what's happening. We jump and run, fight, flight. That's what we were experiencing in our dreams. So what I'm saying is that we have an image creation process going on, that's similar to vision, the construction elements exist. There's a pattern matching process, memory association. All this is going on in a subconscious mind to create that specific response in the dream state. Now, one of my favorite forms of dreaming, side dreaming, is the future. So, some years ago, I reported here on 70 projects that I did with the, with the newspaper. What's going to be on page so-and-so, or it's better pages, on a certain page in the future on a specific day, three days ahead? I tried, I replicated that just a few weeks ago. And this was the first sketch. The dream presents a structure, a very complex old building. It looks like a lot of old buildings, two people looking at a vista. This is what was in the, that page. It's Queen Elizabeth looking over London. So again, the structure is coming in, but I really didn't know what it was or where I was. In another one, it's a very brief dream. And what I drew on the left, I thought was an iron 
an iron uh, stove that somebody had to carry down from the mountain. So when you look at that picture on the right, what do you think it is? It's the black box from German wings that crashed into the Alps. Um, and that wasn't even in the, the, it had, the photo had not been taken at the time. The previous photo that I showed had not been taken at the time of the dream. So these two photos did not exist at the time of the dream. Here was one I did for a newspaper reporter. My sketch on the left, three days later, that's the first page of the picture. He wasn't exactly the best one I ever done, but he was impressed enough with it. So where is the data? Well, there are a lot of possibilities. Um, I like to think in terms that there's an energy information domain that exists. And I recently came across the work of Wolfram Chalmers, who is a theoretical physicist in, uh, with a nuclear research facility in Germany. And um, I like his idea here. Energy is a, not a quality that actually exists in nature. It is an abstract idea, a product of the human mind that tries to understand nature within its capabilities. Energy is primary, only its, its effects are observed. Changes in space-time are secondary, and reality is projected into space-time. And it sort of fits my understanding of the process. Sketch here. The momentum energy is in a different reality. It's a projection to what we call space-time reality, but there's still behind that a basic reality that actually modulates and, and has an influence on all of these. I also think that healing energy and lucid dreams kind of come together in this because we're mobilizing an energy from somewhere. And many, much of it is within the physical body, but it may not always be there. It may be from this other space, this energy space that Schomers talks about. Some of my colleagues and myself have experimented with lucid dream healing and have been very successful, where you actually create the image of the individual you want to heal uh, and imagine various forms of energy, however you perceive energy. Uh, illuminating the spot that needs healing. So this is getting close to the concept of, of energy. In terms of connections with other anomalies, lucid dreaming has really good ones. I think that some UFO perceptions are lucid dreams, accelerated healing can occur, There's, uh, information from the medical field that might benefit from that. And we can also learn from uh, the um, learning process. Here's a research paper that uh, was released a few years ago. The uh, Department of Defense, Office of Naval Research, uh, beginning a research program into the research of the human pattern recognition and decision-making process. Believing there's a sixth sense, this is in the proposal request, uh, through which humans can detect and act <clears throat> on unique patterns without consciously and intentionally analyzing. Well, you and I know that. So finally, uh, the ONR is getting caught up with this thing, but they link it with implicit learning and intuition, which I think is really great. I think the more work can be done here. Uh, I'm very interested in the MEG work and uh, magnetoencephalogram work and other things. Psi perception is accessible. It's holistic and universal. There's a pattern making aspect behind it. It links to evolution and survival. And my bottom line, I think the side principle is continuously running through our primitive gatekeeper of perception. When needed or when sought, automatic responses or sensory awareness and interpretations may occur. I like Escher, a good picture. That's it. <clears throat> I was interested in the picture of the feet with the apple and the key in it, and I wondered whether uh, you, uh, whether you would mention the association of the key be, having like a wing mm -hmm. wings to it, and how that looked like the tree mm -hmm. that had the the wide bands, yeah. mm -hmm. and also the, uh, the the grid with numbers looked like a little keypad mm -hmm. that would that would open a door or uh, a safe, and, and that it, uh, relates to the fact that the key opens a lock. So I wonder whether you had made those associations. Well, yeah, I thought about that, but it, but it looks like the, um, the key almost was a separate part of the dream, like it was just tossed in there. It wasn't exactly in the right place. 
So it, it's part of the picture. So I just took it on as a tree and didn't see it as a key. Um, just part of, part of what we perceived. And I couldn't go beyond that. It just, that was the data. But there was one thing I just remembered, and thank you for bringing it up. On the next slide, the picture with the blue uh, scene, when I blew that up on a large screen, I noticed that some of those figures that we had sketched were from the scratches in the slide. Oh my god. So we actually perceived the scratches <laughs> and turned that into fossil. That's awesome. Uh, again, suggesting to me that there's a, f a future feedback here, or we're looking into our future, look, actually looking, I was looking at the slide maybe 35 years later, I don't know. Well, the other question I had was, you know, if I were taking a skeptical position, I would say, well, you've shown us some really interesting correspondences, yeah. but what was the total field? Did you cherry pick, you know, five images out of 5,000 images or something like that? I chose these because they're the only four in a row. There was another one I didn't have time for, but a similar result. These were the only four that we had these strict controls on, beyond my control. So that's why I chose these four. But I've been working with these slides for a long time. And they, typically, uh, we get anywhere from 60 to 70 percent hits on them. So these were chosen in a way selectively because they were the only ones in this particular grouping that were absolutely under tight control. Thank you. I just wanted to share something potentially interesting really quick. Uh, I used to really be into recording my dreams and very disciplined about it. Uh, in the last 10 years, I've kind of fallen off the dream recording wagon, I guess, so to speak. But um, leading up to the conference, it looks like on May 12th, I had a dream that the conference was centered around the role and function of the amygdala. And uh, I, you know, I just wrote here that there was no specific correspondence to the chakras of the amygdala. Uh, but the entire process of brain evolution is predicated on the attunement of affect to the natural world. So I thought it was kind of interesting. When I saw your slide, I was about floored that uh, kind of a precognitive precursor of, of what you're talking about today. So. In fact, um, based on what I heard in an earlier talk, I'm just wondering if the search for where the so-called signal, if that's the right word, first enters into perception, is there, if, if there's a way to instrument to find to monitor the, the activity in the immediate one. And in fact, years ago, when I, I was fortunate enough to have research funding, I, I actually did um, authorize a, a program to look into mag, magnetoencephalogram measurements that actually pinpoint certain areas in a specific spot within the brain. Now, if that instrumentation could be applied to our, this work, you may be able to identify, is, is it the enigma that's really first coming on the scene? And you would think so because of our primitive, the way the brain evolved. The, even, even the infant has that capability uh, from before, you know, at the time of birth. So I think that's a good area if we could find a way to look at the enigma to see what the signals are or what the responses are coming directly from that. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you about that. All right, let's give our speaker.